Hi friends, this is John, and this is the Regenerative Agriculture Podcast. Welcome back to the funnest, most informative podcast about all of agriculture, where we talk about all kinds of topics related to agronomy, growing plants, human health, soil health, and this wonderful intersection of facilitating a better world and, and a better taking being good stewards of our planet. We're going to have a really fun conversation today. A good friend of mine, Marty Travis, who I met, I don't know exactly, probably roughly a decade ago. I was spent some time at a field day on his farm where we had the most interesting mix of farmers uh, as a group showing up to collaborate and work together that I have ever observed. So Marty, thank you for being here. I've been so... Um, so appreciative of the wisdom and the energy that you have brought to to agriculture and with your farm and being able to facilitate young farmers getting started because there is there is this uh, constant refrain of many people who want to get into agriculture but aren't able to identify a pathway uh, to get land access or to whatever uh, difficulties that they encounter. And so I've really appreciated uh, what you have been able to bring about on your own farming enterprise and with the uh, farmer collaborative that you've developed. So tell us a little bit about uh, your story, your journey, uh, the scope of the work that you're doing today and how you got to this point. Well, first, thank you, John, for, for the opportunity. My journey into agriculture is somewhat convoluted, as many folks tend to have the same experience of being a convoluted path. Um, our family has a 160 acre farm that's been in our family. In six more years, it'll be in our family for 200 years. And I had the opportunity to move back to our family farm in 1999 after my grandmother's passing. Prior to that, for decades, I had built reproduction shaker antique furniture. Um, so I was a woodworker and did work for clients all over the world and loved it, had a blast. I got to meet and do work for some of the most interesting folks you could imagine. But at a point shortly after we moved back to the family farm, my wife, Chris, asked, um, what would you do if a doctor said that you're perfectly healthy, but you really can't do woodwork anymore? And I said, well, I don't know. I guess we've got this cute little farm here. Maybe we ought to do something with it. And the unleashing of doors flying open and windows flying open happened pretty immediately. We began trying to understand what that farm wanted to be, to seek out the energy source of that farm, to create environments for nature to repopulate. Uh, it's part woodland. We recreated a, a five-acre prairie. We had another farmer near us that was actually planting and doing some GMO crops, and we disallowed that from there on and began just really trying our best to create diversity. We got inter introduced to a bunch of chefs in Chicago, and by word of mouth, we discovered very quickly that we would never be able to supply everything that they needed or that they were even asking for. During that time, we also looked at our community. Our community is an agricultural community, and many of the parents were not encouraging their young people to stay on the farm. There wasn't enough land, even if they farmed 3,000 acres, there wasn't enough land to make a viable alternative for the next generation. That seemed crazy to us. That does seem crazy. <laughs> yeah. So 
we began and we created this collaborative group called Stewards of the Land. And, and that group continues unto this day. But in its first few years, we had 25 farms in the group. The majority were under the age of 18. And we were supplying four-star restaurants in Chicago with all of these products from these young people. And it was an amazing opportunity. And here we had, we had folks that were 14, 15 years old making twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 on their one acre garden. And their grandparents, I, I'm speaking of one in particular, his, his grandfather just kept shaking his head. He says, I, you know, we farm hundreds of acres. We don't even come close to what you make. Wow. <laughs> so there was a, there was this kind of paradigm shift that, and it became cool for the kids to garden. And not only, you know, it wasn't that they were having to market their own stuff to a farmer's market or hawk it anywhere else. They couldn't drive it to Chicago. So we created this opportunity that we did the marketing of our product and delivery of our farm's product, but opened it up to these young people. It just grew and grew and grew. Fast forward now 20 years, and we still have young people involved, but we also have a, an amazing group of some experienced farmers, but also new, new to growing farmers. And by this coming spring, we will have very close to 100 farms in our group who we still, I say it's kind of like herding cats down one side of the street in the same direction, but I feel like we're getting pretty good at it. Um, <laughs> um, it's, it's grown tremendously and it's exciting. And those that come to us now are typically being referenced to join the group by our existing farmer base. So in many ways where a lot of the farmers used to compete against each other at farmers markets or for whatever markets there were, now they're basically cooperating and collaborating to help get each other's product to our warehouse, to suggest new farmers. And it's not that we sell everything of everybody's every week, but we are still supply challenged. That's a key point. You're still supply challenged. And, you know, this is, this is something that I find to be so common. Um, you of course have some regional proximity to Chicago, but across the Midwest, there are so many, it's the Midwest, the particular rural areas of the Midwest are essentially a good food desert. And, uh, yet they're within, they're within driving distance, usually several hours drive of a large metropolitan area. So the opportunity that you have is not an uncommon opportunity. It's an opportunity that exists for most people, for, for many farmers across the country. Over, over the past few years, though, I, I've worked with groups in South Dakota and northern Ohio to help them understand how to work cooperatively and how to gain these kinds of markets. And and we've, you know, we have, we've diversified and we're continuing to diversify. It's not just to fancy restaurants. It's to grocery stores, to co-op grocery stores, to school, to school districts, to senior assisted living centers, to not-for-profits um, that are doing work on the south side of Chicago. And we're setting up continued satellite distribution sites on some of our existing farms to to encourage them to to seek their geographic regional farms to help them supply product but we're working toward in those food deserts to supply families with the opportunity to have good wholesome food 
as you work with with other organizations or other groups, cooperative groups of farmers, and the the couple decades of experience that you have uh, guiding the group that you have developed, what are what are the foundational pieces that are required for such an effort to be successful? What um, or maybe a better question is, what are the foundational pieces that are required that many people miss, or that they might not be thinking about? Sure, one of the the key rules that we have for working with folks, whether it be with chefs or clients or farmers. And this may sound a little bit junior high, but we're only going to work with nice people. We're only going to work with folks who are willing to learn, to treat each other with dignity, kindness, and respect. I don't want the drama. None of us need the drama. But when we impart that kind of energy, the good energy, it shows all the way through from planting seeds to feeding families. And that that kindness is really foundational for us. It, it's how we treat our land. It's how we treat our livestock. It's how we treat our plants. It's how we treat each other that we work with. And it, and it sounds, like I said, somewhat childlike, but it has made all the difference in the world for the experience that we have. Aren't we given the directive to be childlike? I think we are. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. No, I I can only imagine I can only imagine the amount of of drama that you have avoided over the years as a result of that very simple rule. And it, and it's I mean we've over all of this period of time I know we've we've had to excuse maybe just one two or three farms farmers just for their unwillingness to 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 continue their compassion. Um, yeah. And I, I would say that um, I can only think of one or two chefs, or restaurants. And, you know, we've, I think we have, I don't know, a few hundred uh, on our, our client list at this point. And, and there's another, there's another concept that I've, I've been able to give to give a, a label to that I think I've discovered in the past year, and that is the art of compassionate persuasion. I'm not trying to sell anything. I'm not trying to be judgmental about somebody else's experience or, or how they wish to be. But in, in learning this art of having compassion, and I mean, it works even with chefs, you know, here we are with below zero temperatures. It's hard. It, it's just hard. So I, I, this morning I had a chef write and say, it looks like the basil I got this week got too cold between the truck and, and the restaurant and it got toasted. And I said, no problem. You understand what we've all been dealing with. We'll be happy to give a give a credit and or replace it for next week. It'll be warmer. There's no hesitation in showing compassion and customer service. And that has made it's made a totally different experience for our farmers and for our chefs. Yeah. What you're what you're speaking of speaks to speaks to so many things. We're actually in the process of of uh, reevaluating our core values as an as an organization at AEA. Like, what are the core values that we actually truly live by? Not not something aspirational that's on the wall that people read, but what is it that we truly live by? And we're we're so blessed to have this amazing team of people mm-hmm. that comes from a place of kindness and compassion. Actually, the very, the very first core value on the list 
is love. It's like that for some organizations that might seem to be so soft or wishy-washy. And it's such a, it's such a big word. It's love means so many different things. And yet it is at the foundation. It's at the root of having empathy for people and kindness and compassion and caring for each other and for caring for uh, the ecosystems and the landscape that we're here to be stewards of. Well, and, and I have, <clears throat> we, in our distribution part of our, of our business called down at the farms. First, we do zero advertising. We've never advertised. We It's all word of mouth and all of those kinds of things. But we've also brought in young people. So the person that runs our warehouse, who receives all the product each week from all the farmers, checks it in, takes care of organizing and all the distribution and all of that, um, she's an 18 year old. She asked me last fall, she said, and, and she also gets to ride along with one of the drivers on the sh Chicago route. We've got two trucks in Chicago each week. And Natalie asked me last fall, she says, can I just set aside some time with you so that I can learn better communication skills and how to build relationships with these chefs? I said, yeah, totally. And I gave her, you know, a lot of, of ideas and, and techniques. And she's totally turned some introverted chefs into smiling near extrovert folks when they show up now. And wow. she's having all these great conversations. Wow. I think something that you've made evident in, in your organization is the, the untapped potential. Uh, our, our society and our culture today, uh, speaking very broadly, not so much the farming community, but speaking broadly, our society undervalues the energy and the possible contribution of youth and also guides them and directs them in pathways of being consumed by social media and video games and on and on the list goes, all kinds of distractions that can distract them from actually um, contributing their productive energies. But I'd, I'd like to ask you a little bit about this. I mean, you, you just described employing an 18-year-old as being the lead person in the warehouse. And you described um, at the beginning you had farmers coming in. Uh, I'm trying to recall, and you said the majority were under the age of 15 or under the age of 18, whatever the number was. Under the age of 18. There were a lot of 14 and 15-year-olds, though. And so... This is one of the pieces that I see being so valuable about the Amish community, mm. is that it gives young people a sense of identity, a sense of place, a sense of purpose, fulfillment, belonging, that they, they know their place in a family and in a community, and they have a purpose as a result of some type of responsibility. So I'm, I'm very interested in exploring this with you. How, do you. how do you manage all of this from a... First of all, there's kind of the regulatory legal compliance perspectives, mm -hmm. but then there's also um, what are the, I'm not even sure of the question that I want to ask here, but what are the management skills that are required for youth compared to with more mature people? It's interesting. So young people obviously have their experiences. And as time goes and we become older, we have more and different kinds of experiences. But young people are still inquisitive. They are still at the very beginning stages of dreaming about who they are and who they are becoming. And that's a very um, great opportunity to help them explore who they are, what feels right to them, what, what kinds of things are they interested in, what do they want to learn about. And typically, many of the traditional educational avenues don't teach some of the things that are most 
important um, about getting along and talking and communicating and learning, even even how do we learn? Uh, there's not there's not a curriculum in most most schools in public school on how to learn. Um, we're just told you need to learn this, but how do we learn? And as we begin to understand how we learn best, then I try to. I, I would say encourage encourage folks to explore those methods, whether we learn best by hands-on or by mentoring, by reading, by watching, by listening to a podcast. The best way that we learn is what I've found is through emotion and intense experience. And having young people given the permission to explore in a safe setting, but also a setting that begins to, to challenge them a little bit is huge. And to not expect, and, I, and I've encouraged a lot of families to look at different enterprises they, 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 the whole family may have one enterprise, but allow their kids to have autonomy and some ownership of certain segments of that enterprise. Not exclusively always taking the, the financial reward of that particular and putting it in the big pot, but allowing them their own expression of receipt and financial reward. I, one, one of the 14, 15 year olds, by the time he graduated high school, had nearly $120,000 in his savings account. Not me when I was that age. <laughs> yeah, and imagine about the, the success that that sets him up for in life in terms of self confidence, self assuredness, business skills, management skills, financial management skills. I mean, there are many young people today who, with access to that kind or even much smaller amounts of funds, would uh, blow it rapidly. But yeah, he now there's there's an appreciation of value there when you have earned it yourself. And and you're you're describing this exact person. He now has a family, um, and is an entrepreneur, and he's doing amazing things, and and living living what he feels is his his good life. So the, the, the mundane, boring question that is probably more fun to not talk about, but we should talk about is how have you managed this from a regulatory perspective? We don't hire um, our farmers and families who have these farm experiences. We do a ton of training for food safety and good agricultural practices. The education aspect is 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 pretty steep and and that education aspect happens even experientially as we go through a season right this is good this isn't as good this is what we're looking for this is the reason that you're having this problem those kinds of things and then on on our in our distribution piece having having an 18 year old and she she runs runs the team and she we've just given her that opportunity and she's capable literally i would not have to show up at the warehouse at all i check on them for about 10 15 minutes a week wow and that's that's it that's that's what i want to be doing i don't need to be I don't need to be the centerpiece of all of this. And for a succession uh, strategy, that's it's not it's not going to be helpful for me to keep control. I I just want to mentor these folks and help them get to, you know, a success in their life and that they feel like this is their best their best experience. Can you give us some context of the scale that you are talking about? You mentioned that you'll have 100 farmers this coming growing season. You started out with about 25. 
uh, what is the diversity of different crops that you're growing and um, what is the what's the volume of produce that you're dealing with so the 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 projection for this year will probably be approaching four million dollars in product everything from cheese to vegetables and fruits eggs honey syrup um, grains, flour, cornmeals, uh, rice, beef, chicken, pork, lamb, goat, turkey, and then some uh, prepared, a small amount of value-added products, um, but mostly it's, it's raw vegetable and raw off-the-farm products that, that we're offering. We have two refrigerated trucks in Chicago each week. We deliver 50 out of 52 weeks a year. Um, we take Christmas and New Year's off to give everybody in a break and so that I can do you know, more work of, of crop planning and all of those things with everyone. But oh, but oh, but Marty, you really have it backwards. Those are the highest sales weeks of the year. <laughs> um, <laughs> they are. <laughs> um, and then we have one to two trucks downstate in central Illinois each week also. As we move forward a year from now, we will have an additional three deliveries a week in Chicago. Uh, so basically Monday, Wednesday, Friday in Chicago with an additional truck and in addition to the two trucks we have currently. It's like trying to manage growth and and the way that we as farmers and we as business people would manage growth is how we manage cash flow but we have to manage our growth in control i yeah there's way more demand than what we have product and farmers for at the present time our goal is not to become the biggest distribution uh, hub of farm products, but our goal is to become the best. And I want to see more of these hubs across the country, across the world, because it they're farmer to farmer. And the shorter the distance from the farm to the end user, and if we can keep those dollars circulated within the farm community, all the better. I think about all the millions of dollars we've brought back into our county and into central Illinois. I mean, I kind of liken it that everybody brings their product, drops it off on Tuesday. Wednesday, we run it up to Chicago, drop it off, grab everybody's money, come back, and on Thursday, pass it around to the farmers, and then we do it again the next week. You know, I, I grew up in a community. My, my uh, father was a founding member of the local produce auction and it had many of the aspects that you're describing with one very important distinction that was that they were selling at wholesale and they were price takers and not price makers and uh, that has led to a downward spiral of this uh, local produce auction along with many others across the country not all there are some that are actually doing very very well but um they seem to be in a minority from what I can tell. So what is the, what's the diversity of crops that you're growing? You mentioned that you're taking, oh, actually you did speak about the, the animal products a little bit, but are you also doing medicinal herbs, um, vegetables, fruits, tree fruits? Uh, what, what does the spread look like? All of that as, and even wild collected, wild foraged items, herbs, all the greens that you can imagine, probably as many as 40 or 50 different varieties of peppers, tomatoes, uh, melons, you know, just part of, part of what I'll do when I talk with a new farm is I'm always trying to understand before I'm understood, but I'm trying to understand what they want to do. And, and who they want to be as a farmer, who they want to be known as. And then, 
and then try to find, say, six to 12 crops that spread the, the season that they can have cash flow and that, that match their soil, match their farm, match their time, all of those things, and match their interest. Yeah, I, I need more of this or more of that, but if that farm and that farmer isn't, isn't into that, we're not going to get the best product. I mean, it's, it's everything, John. I mean, I've got a request for emu and emu meat and emu eggs right now. That's, that's different. It's, it really is a relationship with our chefs. So in determining prices, for years, I've spent time with our chefs saying, okay, what are you looking for? What do you wish that you could get that you aren't getting? And what are you willing to pay for this? What, you know, understanding that this is a two-way street. And if we're going to have these opportunities continue, we have to make it such that the restaurants and, and the grocery stores and everybody has their part of the pie. And so it's easy for me to have those conversations and now teaching Natalie how to have those conversations about what's, what's this worth to you? What else are you paying typically? I asked one of our, one of my favorite chefs this fall, I said, can you give me, and we've worked with him for nearly, I don't know, 15 years. And I said, can you give me an idea if you think that we are overpriced? He said, no, you're not overpriced. He says, you're just the most expensive, expensive uh, uh, train in town. <laughs> he said, but the thing is, you've got the best quality product of, of anybody else that we can get from. And he says, so we know what we're getting. And he says, we're, we know that this is what we need to pay. That is a perception that comes with uh, with age and wisdom and experience. <laughs> <laughs> but it also comes yep. with the relationship. Yep. Um, because, and I'm not out there trying to guilt anybody into, into paying more than what the market should bear, but I'm definitely out there saying, this is what our farmers have in it. And this is what it takes to get that product to you. And I'm not about undercutting the farmers. If, if there's any way possible, that's, that's the last thing I want to do. Yeah. So let's, let's talk a bit about um, your own farming operation. You started this originally a decade and a half ago as, as an opportunity for for lack of a better way to describe it, for for other beginning farmers to join your delivery truck, that's just kind of the way that it all started. And now you have this uh, this remarkable collaborative organization. Uh, how has what has been the journey of your own farm in that period of time? How do, how did you uh, what what proportion of the total organization was your farm in the beginning? Where is it today? And then. Uh, I'd love to also talk about the the crops and the production practices on your farm and the way that that has evolved as well. You know, I took one of these Clifton Strengths assessments recently about you know your strengths as as different personality traits and stuff. That's interesting. I also I also did in the last year for the first did time. Did you? <laughs> so my superpower is adaptability. Um, and that serves us really well. You're right. We have evolved as a farm. And I think we, we did the thing at the very beginning of, uh, I don't know that it's a mistake, but it's, it's definitely part of the arc of, of learning of planting 250 varieties of everything possible that sounds fun out of the the porn seed catalogs that, that, that they send us 
<laughs> That's the first time I've heard that adjective used to describe a seed catalog, but actually I think it's quite appropriate. Um, and, and actually, uh, as an aside, I have for years, and I haven't so much in the last couple, but for years, I would get cases of seed catalogs from the major companies and distribute them to our chefs and ask them to go through and and see what because they're visual people and they're artistic people it was a way that i could get them to make a list of the things that they wanted to serve on their plates and i says all you got to do is go through put an x next to the things that that you that you like that you see and i says let me know how much you need a week and i'll i'll get farmers to grow it that was huge that was huge so yes at the beginning we grew everything um whether we needed to or not and we sold we sold tons of stuff but we also listened to what our chefs were asking for or where there were gaps and as we've gone our biggest income producing crop for for Spence Farm at this point, Will and Will, my son, basically does most of the farm aspect at this point with a, a great team of, of young girls, too. He does wheat, rye, and some grains, different grains, and, and mills every week, rye flour, wheat flour, cracked rye, cracked wheat, and the vast majority of it goes to one bakery in Chicago, hundreds and hundreds of pounds a week. If if I might ask Marty, just as a interlude, what is the uh, what's the price point per pound that they're receiving? I want to provide some inspiration to other listeners. This is this is where where I'm going with this too. A um, dollar fifty to a dollar seventy five a pound, so roughly about ninety dollars a bushel. And that, my friends, is the difference between selling product per pound and selling it per ton. Yes. And that has been game changing. We don't have to, and, and we're not, we don't have to grow a thousand acres of wheat. We only need, I don't know, 15, 20 acres of wheat and rye and, and some corn. One variety of our corn that we've, that we've kind of brought back from near extinction, it sounds like, is this Iroquois white corn. I basically had to uh, do a, a reduction in our price because the chef offered more than what I thought it was worth. Um, he was willing to pay $20 a pound for this roasted white corn meal. And I said, we would probably get beat up really hard by our neighbor conventional farmers if they realized that we were making you know over a thousand dollars a bushel on on our corn and so we settled at fifteen dollars a pound for it and and we we only need to grow like an acre or two acres of it to make to make bank for the year um so there's that's incredible there's a lot of that and so now we're kind of streamlining things. We've, we're putting in an eight acre orchard with peaches, apricots, nectarines, plums, apples, pears. Um, we want to do some brambles in there, figs, if we can pull that off. Will still does the grains. We have a wild uh, harvested pawpaws but also a, a plantation that we've put in that's producing really well. In the last year, uh, we did a lot of brassica crops, uh, cabbages, brussels, broccoli, kale, along with, we, we sell, we plant a lot of squash and sell squash blossoms at 50 cents a piece. I don't really particularly care if we end up harvesting squash off of it. That's, that's, bonus if we do but if we can have squash blossoms we could sell as many as three thousand blossoms a week and it's quick it's you harvest them 
uh, a couple mornings before Wednesday at 5 30 6 o'clock in the morning for an hour and you can you can create a lot of, of revenue um, during the, the summer months for that so we we've, we've really done some of the more challenging crops and kept those for ourselves but but it's been it's been good it's it's been a way that we can we can make uh small plots you know as much as you know i think will's probably on 35 acres in the south field and eight acres of orchard there's a 50 acre field across the road that he's doing some more conventional organic food grade crops but the vegetable side is is between five and ten acres you know this this whole conversation about the the price point for grains and growing squash blossoms which is something that uh we did on the farm that i grew up on as well was harvesting squash blossoms Uh, there's what is striking to me about this conversation is in some ways, Marty, you, you remind me of kind of my outlook on life. I, I have a different strengths pattern than what you describe, but I'm always just, I, I travel the countryside and I look at what is happening in rural landscapes and look at what is happening in cities. And to me, there is just, I, I see this, this overwhelming opportunity. Mm-hmm. It's just the land is awash with opportunity. There is... There are no boundaries. It's your imagination is the limit. It's it's not accurate to say that the sky is the limit. The sky is not the limit. It's your imagination that is the limit. You are the limit. I've really come... And, and, and then I can travel the exact same pathways and with other people who um, have a different mind. They're just... They're different individuals. They have different history. And, and they don't see the opportunity. They don't see what I see. They don't see the potential that exists. And so I'm delighted to be having this conversation with you because not only have you been able to see the opportunity, but also to manifest it and to turn it into reality in, in your own, um, in, in the pathway that you've been on. And so I'd love to ask the question for young people, or not just necessarily young people, but for starting farmers, even for established farmers, for people who have an interest and going down the pathway that you're describing, who are not located in Illinois or not in your geographic region, what advice would you have for them to identify and to develop these these opportunities that exist? One, I feel like it is, it begins with some introspection. Who do you want to be determines what you're going to do. What financial program, what do you need this experience to become? What's the goal? What's the dream? If it's just, I need to make some extra money on the side in the summertime with the kids are home, or I, I want to get to a point where um, this becomes my, my, you know, foundational income. I want to do something with my partner or, you know, you, you have some definition that needs to happen first. Then before you plant a single thing, we need to identify where does it go? Where's the market? And how are we going to access that market? Farmers markets are okay, but they're way too risky. And and I don't know for sure just where it all came from, but Will tells this story that there's a difference between an introverted farmer and an extroverted farmer. An introverted farmer in conversation will look at his own shoes while he's talking to you. An extroverted farmer will look at your shoes as he's talking to you. <laughs> That's hilarious. What I find is <laughs> what I find is that a lot of farmers really are not that interested in talking about their product. 
They're not interested in promoting who they are and, and what they're doing. And I get that. And that's part of, that's part of our success because I can, it's way easier for me to brag on these kids that are producing all of this stuff. I mean, how, who doesn't want to buy stuff from kids, right? Uh, they want to support that. So I just use that. And it's way easier for me to talk about our farmers, other farmers product than it is about what I'm doing specifically or what we are doing on our farm. And I find that that's a benefit to all of our farmers. I'm not saying that you can't develop those skills, but but find find ways to understand and match those skills that you have or that you are going to learn with the markets that you wish to enter. Do a ton of research before you leave your, your regular job, whether it's going to farmer's markets, whether it's going and researching at grocery stores or eating out and talking to chefs, whether it's talking to a school district about providing them salad greens and tomatoes during the summer. Do you want this income to be year round? Then you're going to need to figure out some kind of cold storage to hold crops. Do you want to just, you know, sell tomatoes and and peppers in the summer and be done and do something else? Do you also have the capacity to do somewhat like what we've done and provide this opportunity, this extra opportunity of coordination and marketing and delivering for other farmers in your area? There's many ways to access the food system. And I just feel like we we need to to really think about in real ways how we do that and not just haphazardly say i'm going to plant an acre of tomatoes and somebody's going to buy them that's a recipe for disaster yeah somebody isn't there yeah you know when when i think to the, the way that you started out um this this conversation of identifying what it is that you really want in your life. What is the goal? What's the North Star? It, it occurs to me that it's very difficult for many people to figure that out for themselves. Because it's, it's like uh, when, you tell, when you tell someone, oh, you can be anything you want to be, then it's, the possibilities are too vast. It's like you don't know you don't know where to begin, you don't know where to start. And in addition to that, many people who perhaps have growing experience, who have established farms, um, are trapped by their context. They're trapped by history. They are trapped by what they think they know and by the, how they think about themselves. That, oh, I'm a livestock farmer or, oh, I'm a grass farmer. Whatever it is that we're, we're trapped by our own internal narrative and our own uh, self constructs, and there's a valuable exercise that I've found for breaking out of this. And it was uh, I learned it from Vishen Lakiani from Mind Valley. You can just do a simple search for Mind Valley Three Goals. You know what I'm talking about? I do. I do. Yeah. So very much. Yes. I've um, the 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 exercise is that there are there are kind of three fundamental. Uh, goals who really define who we are and uh, where we would like to be in life and that really define our sense of fulfillment and satisfaction. And so they developed this this process of using a stopwatch. And this is such an important part, as a critical part, in fact, using a stopwatch or a timer and giving yourself 90 seconds to answer each of these questions, 90 seconds per question. And the three questions are, what is it that you would like to experience? How would you desire to grow? And what do you desire to contribute? And those three pieces really encompass so much. And so I have, 
I've many times gone through people, I've gone through this exercise with people one-on-one, -on -one, and I tell them at the beginning of the exercise that they don't need to share anything that they write down if they don't want to. This is completely confidential. They can keep everything to themselves to give them the freedom to write down whatever it is that they would like. And many times we go through those three questions, we go through that exercise, and they look at that piece of paper and they become very emotional. Because that, that process of limiting yourself by a timer completely, you don't have time to think. There is no time to think. You just got to start writing. And so it, you short circuit out the conscious brain. You go straight into the subconscious. And they look at that piece of paper and they almost burst out into tears. Several people have burst out into tears. To see that inner part of themselves revealed on paper for the first time. And so in the context of what you're describing, I often ask people to go through that exercise twice. First, for themselves personally in their personal life, and then to go through and answer the same questions again in a business context, in their growing context, like what is it that they want to experience and how do they want to grow and what do they want to contribute? So I'm delighted, Marty. You're, you're actually the, you're the first person that I've encountered who I've shared this with, um, who is already familiar with it. What has been your experience with it? Mind Valley, one of the other um, instructors and, and contributors is Jim Quick. Jim K W I K. He is a brain and memory coach and communications and all of that. And that has been tremendous. And so I, I've passed that on to our staff folks and, and it's, you know, one of the things that I'm helping Natalie do is, and, and actually our drivers. And this is something that I did for, but I did it for like, 20 years, you learn everybody's name in every restaurant. You learn the chef, the sous chef, the dishwasher, the person that writes the checks, all of that. And if you've got 30 restaurants, you need to figure out a system that you're going to remember those, those names. And that's where it is so critical that when Natalie shows up, she says, hey, Luke, how's it going this week? What, do you, what, what was your experience with whatever we brought last week? That tells everybody that she's paying attention. There was an experience several years ago that I had with a chef. He and I, you know, I delivered to him every week. Really great guy. While we're standing there talking for 10 minutes, this other delivery person from a, uh, one of the broadliner trucks brought his stuff down into the kitchen with his two wheel cart, handed the chef his receiving page, his form. The chef signed it, handed it back to him. The guy left. And I said to the chef, I says, do you know that guy's name? He says, no. I said, does he deliver every week? He says, yes. And I said, have you ever talked with him? No. I says, why is it that it's okay for you to stand here and talk to me for 10 minutes and spill everything that you've been talking about and you don't even know that guy's name? He said, I never thought of it that way. And I said, he's bringing you food too. And I'm bringing you food. It's just that I'm bringing you our food. But he says, his, his, he's still an important piece to all of this. What I say that story because we all want to be known by who we are. And doing purposeful work gives us as farmers and us in this whole food system, doing that purposeful work and creating this opportunity to know and be known is the leg up. Thank you, Marty. Those are, that is, this is such an important piece. Um, and this speaks to the point that you made earlier about um, some farmers and some growers being more comfortable talking to plants and animals than they are talking to other people. Mm -hmm. And that these, these relationships are so important. And I think this is, this is a piece like I'm uh, there is no question in my mind with the with the organization that you have um, 
the collaboration that is required, there are many occasions where you need to provide critical feedback that um, could be perceived as negative feedback. But there's, there's this quote, and I, I just, I keep repeating it over and over because it is so deep and meaningful. Like when we truly grasp what it really means, the outcome of an intervention is determined by the internal state of the intervener. It's not determined by the words you say. When you come from the right state within, from the right heart, from the right place within, that's going to determine to a degree what you say and how you say it. And also to a degree, it's not that important anymore. That's right. Um, I, 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 still, I still remember, you know, I, I have so many amazing conversations here on the podcast, but the one of the earlier podcast episodes that quickly became one of the most listened to was also the one uh, was with Dr. Michael McNeil. And he was very direct and very candid with people. He said things that, depending on who would have said the things Michael said, people could have been very offended. He said things like, stop poisoning your land. Very blunt sentences that were impossible to misinterpret. But people were not offended. People were not upset. Why? Because they could tell that he cared. That he cared deeply about them. He cares deeply about farmers, growers. He cares deeply about the land. And because he was coming from the right place within, if someone else would have said that coming from a place of judgment, that would have been a conversation killer. Right then, right there. Mm -hmm. And... I've, I've lost my train of thought. I forget why I started saying this, but it's, it's such an important aspect of how we show up in the world and how we interact with people. It is. And yes, the skills and the techniques that we all use to talk about food and farm products, they're the same techniques and skills that can be used in most anything. But it's how the com how the emotion is shared and the experience that we're trying to enable for the producers and the consumers that really is totally different than somebody going to dollar general or or the grocery store, or wherever they access food. We want a different experience. And it doesn't, and it's not a judgment thing. It's, it is just, we don't have to feed the world. We just have to take care of the folks in our communities. Everybody eats. And if everyone, if everyone around the world does that, and if everyone cleans their own sidewalk, then the world is take, is taken care of. It is. So, uh, Marty, we uh, we went down this this awesome derailment uh, when we started talking about uh, we were talking about your farm. We started talking about grain production and uh, what your monetary rewards look like for grain production. But I'd like to come back and dig into. Uh, your personal farming operation a little bit. Uh, it's really exciting to hear that. I'm really excited to hear that you're planting an orchard. That was not present when I was there last, which is right. now quite a few years ago. But how has your uh, your vegetable management, uh, your grain crop management, uh, your orchard management, how has that uh, system evolved? Um, there's, there's lots of discussions today about uh, tillage and no-till and nutrition management. And obviously we talk a lot about nutrition management here. So I'm really uh, interested in digging into that a little bit and to understand uh, what your cultural management practices look sure. like. We're not strictly no-till. Um, it's it's difficult with our soil and, and all of those kinds of things and, and just the equipment that we use. But in the winter time, if you were to drive through the, the the countryside, you would know that you've arrived at our farm because it's it is covered with cover crops or you know winter weeds and rye and those kinds of things, alfalfa um, and such. Where we feel like we have turned a corner 
is by utilizing things like a fall soil program, by utilizing every seed that we plant, every tree that we plant, using a seed coat treatment, inoculating all of our wheat, all of our rye, all of our corn, all of the trees in, that we planted. We planted peach trees with 12 inch tall bare root seedlings three years ago at the end and utilized a transplant solution and foliar feeding at least a couple times a month during the growing season. At the end of the first season, those 12 inch seedlings were seven feet tall. Wow. The next year they bloomed and we pulled the blossoms off to prune and, and strengthen the, the tree up a little bit. Last year we had some peaches that were remarkable. And this year we will let them go to their whatever full potential they want to do. Marty, you're you're not supposed to be able to grow organic peaches in Illinois. Well, that's what everybody at such and such a place tells us. <laughs> I will tell you, we, we've also had another uh, couple peach trees that we planted several years ago. And a couple years ago, we harvested off of one semi-dwarf peach tree, 330 pounds of peaches. And we processed all of them ourselves, never found a worm, never had a blemish. They were all just beautiful, beautiful peaches. And, and if you think about it, I could sell peaches to our restaurant chefs at $4 a pound. Wow. So that tree would have made over $1,200 in peaches. You start putting hundreds of peaches in, into an acre or two acres. And if you don't want to, to, harvest potatoes or or salad greens or pick green beans peaches are a good thing because everybody likes their fruit and we will have no problem selling selling all of this fruit from this orchard you know my my mind is going in about three different directions at once but uh there's there's this story. Every time I think of Marty Travis and every time I think of Spence Farm, there's one thing that I remember. And that is, I remember being at a field day on your farm. I wonder how many years ago, how many years ago do you think that was? It was in 2016, I think. I, I looked it back up. Okay. It was in 2016. So that's now eight years ago. Yeah. And uh, of all the things that I saw on your farm that afternoon that we were there the story of the potato crop that was only that was down to stems and what that potato crop then looked like that will always be in my mind do you remember that story yeah we we had struggled with uh, potato beetles really hard um, go ahead and, and relate your 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 remembrance of this well, what I remember is uh, you described at the field day was there were, I don't know, there must have been 60 or 80 people out looking at the crops mm -hmm. that you had this potato, you had this severe infestation of potato beetles that came along and they stripped the plants down to stems that there was not, there were no leaves left. And in fact, as any new young leaves emerged, they were destroyed as fast as they emerged. Mm hmm. And then you put on a foliar spray that uh, I think comprised largely or maybe entirely of rejuvenate. And um, let's just say that when I was there three weeks later, you would never have been able to tell that there were ever any Colorado potato beetles there. So what happened? That experience has been repeated a few times. We used some sap analysis in subsequent years to understand where we were short. And literally after a tuned up application of foliars, the beetles were gone. 
and we totally had an amazing crop. Similarly, this past year, we were without rain for 10 weeks. Our cabbage crop, our broccolis, all of that were absolutely gorgeous. We did weekly uh, foliar applications with a forage blend. And on, on our crop day at the end of June, we had lots of farmers there from all over. As we walked in the field, between the rows was totally dry. Underneath the cabbage plants, you scratch down a quarter to a half inch and it's moist. It's like really moist. We feel that with increased biology, utilizing the rejuvenate and sea shield spectrum, I mean, even in our orchard, we did double doses of that. In one fall, we did two doses and then another dose in the spring. We have alfalfa fields that are eight years on and we're getting in the first three cuttings, those cuttings are almost all identical in in tonnage. Yes, that's the way it's supposed to be. That's awesome. Um, and we typically get five cuttings off of that field every year. As we continue to increase the biology in our soil on our farm, we see greater drought resistance in our plants. We see greater health, less bug pressure, less disease pressure. It just, it just makes sense. And I, I've heard you speak about it. It's like a hamster wheel. When you have biology, then you have mineral nutrition availability, higher photosynthesis, higher photosynthesis makes more biology. It just flows. And We've just experienced that over and over and trying to share that with our farmers group because we're, we're spread out across the state on various kinds of, of soil conditions and, and soils and, and all of that. But it's important for us, for our customers to have consistent quality product from whatever farm it comes from. And so having this opportunity for the education and for our farmers to understand what that is and how to get to that place. I had another beginning farmer last year. They've always gardened and I had seen their garden the year before and their cherry tomato plants were about three feet tall and they were, they were okay, but they weren't great. And so I put them on a, on, on a system of, of the fall soil program. I put them onto a foliar feed once a week. They about freaked out. Their tomato plants were eight feet tall, cherry tomatoes. They were picking 150 pounds of cherry tomatoes on about a 40 foot, 50 foot row every week. And they felt like they'd bit off way big, big piece of something to chew, but they were making money and they were excited. They were blown away by the potential that great soil biology and full plant nutrition can achieve. And their cherry tomatoes became the most coveted cherry tomatoes of most of our growers to the chef community. They said, we need those cherry tomatoes. That's where possibilities are endless. Marty, your, your experience and what you're communicating is, is interesting in that, um, in the, in the commercial scale grower community today, uh, labor is a significant challenge and there are growers in some areas are opting for fewer foliar applications and more irrigation applications just from a labor efficiency perspective do you you're you're going in a different direction from what i can tell you're doing less irrigation i I, is it 
Am I correct in thinking that at one point you were doing some irrigation applications and are you still doing those? No, okay. no. Spence Farm, we really don't have irrigation set up. And to be honest, our crops looked better in the drought than when it started raining in July and August. And it became harder and harder to make our applications. It became issues of we, we couldn't get out in the field because it was just way too wet. And the crop conditions suffered with more rain than they did with less rain. Yeah, that's, that's a fairly common response when growers are in a, on a more a biological nutrition delivery system because biology in the soil profile can actually continue to thrive even in what we consider to be dry soil. But once soil uh, becomes really wet and saturated and oxygen levels drop, then that profile becomes a lot more challenged. So, well, and, and I will say a few years ago, we had a situation where we had nearly six inches of rain in two days. All of the neighbor's fields, this was like in June, I would say, all the neighbor's fields were ponded and just lots of standing water. We had zero of that on our farm. So we, we were able to have all of that rain captured and infiltrate into our soil. And we could still go out and pull, you know, a wheat plant or a rye plant and have full flocculation on the root system of that plant, even after six inches of rain. And you could shake you could shake the the dirt off of it. It wasn't like it was a slurry. So I know, I know we still have ways to go, but, and then, you know, two years ago, Will on, <laughs> on, on his field of, of wheat, uh, ended up with 105 bushel wheat, organic, utilizing wheat varieties from the mid 1800s he had that's not supposed to happen i know he had higher wheat yields than most everybody in our community and was the wheat also uh being uh, having foliar applications applied to it or was this purely as a result of soil health it had two two applications wow so since you've started using the foliar applications, what uh, what has the progression of plant health been like? You've given us a couple of examples, but did you begin using foliar applications right when you started growing originally? Um, mm -hmm. And and what has your trajectory been like from a an overall yield and quality perspective? Prior to to AEA, we had experimented with a lot of different products, um, soil amendment products, we did soil testing and all of those things and tried to add, you know, bio biologicals to really no discernible in, increase in, in, a, in a soil test or otherwise. Once we basically did just some of the basics of utilizing the Rejuvenate Fall Soil Program and seed treatment, those were where we started. We began to see larger plants, bigger fruit, more pollination and better germination, better root systems, all of those things. And then once we've kind of dialed in what we think we need for each of these plant crops, and then have that confirmed by some just random sap analyses with certain crops. We feel like we've really developed and understood a system of weekly applications where weather allows. It's, it's just night and day. It is totally night and day. And the young, young team that, that Will has, you know, one of the girls, is she was on it all the time she's also an ffa and 
she got to go to a statewide competition and she talked about the AEA products and, and everything of what she does and her experience. And, and she got first place. Um, wow. <laughs> that's, and, and, and for her to be able to explain and none of the judges had a clue about it, of course. Um, but she was able to share with other students there and the judges there and talk just beautifully about her experience and what her knowledge base has become. That's incredible, Marty. Yeah. That's incredible. So when you have lots of visitors and chefs and people coming to visit your farm, what intrigues people or surprises people? What do they see and experience and observe on your farm that they find fascinating? Flavors especially chefs, but, but anybody, if I gave them a peach or an apple, they're just blown away by it. They say, I, you know, we've never had anything like this. And the, you know, the peach juice is running down their elbow and, and all of those, those experiences and just, you know, the fragrance of it. I've had chefs even looking at kale, and they'll say, why, why is this leaf so much thicker than what I get from farms somewhere else? And there's an education opportunity. We've had one specific variety of pepper that, there's two, two pepper stories. Shortly after you were there, we were us, utilizing AEA foliar sprays on our pepper plant. And our pepper crop went through six frost events and all the other farmers that we had lost all their peppers. We were still harvesting peppers the first part of November out of the field, unprotected. We used some accelerate and some sea stem to, to mitigate frost. And finally, Chris says, would you just mow these things off? She says, we're, <laughs> we're sick of peppers. We mowed them off. They started coming back. <laughs> and it took 15 degrees before it killed them. Wow. That's an incredible story. <laughs> yes. Those, I mean, with plant nutrition, I feel like we can help our farmers in our group manage environmental conditions. We can make longer season extension. Where you make the money is on the edges, right? And if we can have earlier crops and later crops, if I can, if I can give our farmers an extra three to four weeks worth of crop income, that's game changing. Yeah, that is completely game changing. You mentioned that you had two pepper stories. If the second one is anywhere near as good as the first, I don't want to lose sight of it. We were picking, we were picking Ajay Dolce peppers. These plants are about, oh, probably waist high. We were picking them in October, 200 foot rows. And there would probably be, I would say, five pounds per plant and they're small peppers. Um, they're like two and a half inch long peppers. And the week before Justin and Jeremy had picked one row clean of ripe peppers. The next week we were picking, it, it looked like they had never been there and we had so many more peppers. We picked crates and crates of these peppers that we sell at five dollars a pound and so i always have told told the guys we just need to make sure that every transplant is making us five dollars well those poor pepper plants were making sounds like they were rich pepper plants they were really rich pepper plants <laughs> um and of course we sold every pepper that we that we had so 
I'm sorry, I interrupted you. You you had started saying those rich pepper plants were making. If off of that one picking at the end of October, we were getting five pounds, that was $25 off of that one picking. And we had been picking since August. Well, Marty, if nothing else, I hope that our conversation has really inspired some people by the economic opportunity that exists by growing non-commodity stuff, by growing the unusual things that have exceptional flavor and aroma that chefs and consumers really crave. I hope so, too, because that's that's where the financial part of of this regenerative agriculture piece makes the difference the the experience the emotion the fun i mean you you talk about fun it's pretty fun when you're when you're picking peppers and you have to keep a straight face of of what you're doing and and where it's going to go and you know what you're going to make off of this that's that's where i want want all of us to be yeah you're absolutely right. It's a lot of fun. You know, I, I remember when I was growing up, tomatoes were a major crop for us. And we would usually do an acre to an acre and a quarter of tomatoes per year in different stages, different plantings. And uh, when the tomato crop was doing really well, and of course we were selling wholesale, but when the prices were really good, every tomato was worth a dollar. Yeah. And it, that's quite something to be out there. Uh, we, ha we had 605 gallon buckets were our set of picking containers. And there were many days that we would fill those by 10 or 11 o'clock in the morning. Yeah. And you just think every time you reach out a hand and harvest a tomato, it's worth a dollar. That is a very interesting type of motivation, I will tell you. It is. Absolutely. Absolutely. I. I had an experience with my granddaughter when she was three years old. She she went out to help pick cherry tomatoes with me one day, and we needed 10 pounds, so we were picking a flat of, of cherry tomatoes, and she would pick and pick and pick, and I was picking and picking and picking, and she's three years old, and she kept popping a couple in her mouth every so often, and she says, Papa, you got you to gotta taste them every so often to make sure we're picking just the good ones. <laughs> They were all good. <laughs> yeah. They were all good. That's an awesome note to end on. Marty, I want to say thank you. Thank you for your leadership in your community and for the wisdom that you bring. Thank you for sharing here on the podcast. I've really enjoyed this conversation and I look forward to having more with you in the future. Me too, John. Thanks for the opportunity. And for all of our listeners, uh, I'm going to include links to Marty's farm and to the work that they're doing in the show notes that you can find on the podcast website at regenerativeagriculturepodcast.com. Thank you all for listening. The team at AEA and I are dedicated to bringing this show to you because we believe that knowledge and information is the foundation of successful regenerative systems. At AEA, we believe that growing better quality food and making more money from your crops is possible. And since 2006, we've worked with leading professional growers to help them do just that. At AEA, we don't guess, we test, we analyze, and we provide recommendations based on scientific data, knowledge, and experience. We've developed products that are uniquely positioned to help growers make more money with regenerative agriculture. If you are a professional grower who believes in testing instead of guessing, someone who believes in a better, more regenerative way to grow, Visit advancingecoag.com and contact us to see if AEA is right for you. Thank you for listening, and we look forward to working with you.